Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Dr. Matthew W.I. Dunn, and I want to welcome you to the course that we're going to be uh, participating in during the spring semester at Gwynedd Mercy University. This is today's first class, but as you know, due to inclement weather, a snowstorm, um, we will not be meeting on campus. We are meeting virtually, which means basically that by which I mean that I'm going to, I'm recording this video, which I will then upload to YouTube. Um, there are two courses that I'm actually discussing today, but the syllabus is 90% the same. So I'm going to um, use both syllabi and I'll switch back and forth between them when the information is different. But for the most part, the, syl the syllabi are exactly the same. So if you are in, for example, world religions, don't freak out that you see Christian faith, the Christian faith syllabus here, because I have the world religion syllabus right there, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But I'm going to start out with Christian faith, because Christian faith is the first um, course that meets on Tuesday, for me on Tuesdays and Thursdays, if not for you. Okay, so let's get to it. The syllabus. And I will preface this by saying that I know that going over the syllabus is a boring endeavor, but it has to be done. You need to know what is required of you for the course, what your ex and we'll address your expectations for the course. And uh, I can answer and maybe address some questions you might have about the course by going through the syllabus. So let's get, let's get started. But first, before that, a nice sip of coffee. Well, mostly coffee. <laughs> No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's all coffee here, baby. What did you think I was referring to? There could be sugar in the coffee. <laughs> ah. Anyways, um, the course syllabus. As I said, I'm teaching two courses. Uh, I'm teaching Christian faith, and then I'm teaching world religions. And the syllabi are the same for each, except for those things that are particular to each course. So let's start with Christian faith. Um, know the course that you're in. You you should of course you should of course no pun intended know which course you're in. If you are in Christian faith, then it meets on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And let me just make this bigger so you can see it see it better. It meets on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 11 a.m. and goes until 12, 15 p.m. And it meets in St. Bernard's Hall in room 19. Okay, so make note of that. Make sure that you're there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> My name is Dr. Matthew W.I. Dunn. Uh, I'm an adjunct uh, instructor here at Gwynedd Mercy. Uh, adjunct instructors don't really have an office over in the, uh, the, the building. Uh, I forget the official name for it, but the building where all the faculty are. Um, but uh, so there's really no office to speak of. So if you do want to see me, we can make an appointment and we can meet somewhere on campus at a certain time. OK, uh, the, the the preferred way to reach me and the best way to reach me is through my uh, Gwynedd Mercy email, which I give to you again, because adjuncts don't really have an office per se. There is no phone for you to call me. So that's not an option. The description for the course of Christian faith, I'll get to world religions in a second, but for Christian faith, this is the course description according to the catalog. This course examines the features of religious faith that are common to Protestant and Catholic Christianity, basic Christian beliefs, characteristics of adult faith development adult faith development, commitment to one's Christian faith in a contemporary world are treated in an ecumenically sensitive manner. Okay, so basically, the, in a nutshell, the course is about Jesus Christ, and it's about the religion that has um, that has developed from the Jesus movement, those who follow Jesus, uh, and has uh, developed and is existing even to the present day. The uh, the main it's interesting they say the main focus will be on Protestant and Catholic Christianity, but one of the oldest forms of Christianity, which is Eastern Orthodox Christianity, is not mentioned. Interestingly enough, I only mention that because I am an Eastern Catholic, um, or as we like to sometimes say, I'm Eastern Orthodox in communion with the Pope of Rome. Anyways, um, the characteristics of adult faith development, frankly, I don't know what the person who wrote this description for the catalog means by that. Um, I'm presuming it means by getting the information for the course, it help, helping you to critically think about your faith um, throughout the course. That is, that is what is meant. Okay, if that's what's meant, then fine. But I add a caveat, nota bene, NB, 
Gwynedd Mercy is a Catholic university. As such, I think that Catholicism should be the primary focus. I am a Catholic theologian, okay? I, I'm not a Protestant. I wasn't raised Protestant. I do know something about Protestant Christianity, as I know something about Eastern Orthodox Christianity. But the material will be presented primarily from a Roman Catholic point of view, just so you know. But I will make a concerted effort to present other Christian views, especially when they diverge from a Roman Catholic perspective. Okay? Not that I'm going to always, you know, talk about, oh, we disagree on that, we disagree on that, but it give other, maybe other positive perspectives of this is another way of looking at it, and this is how Protestants would look at it, and this is how Eastern Orthodox would look at it. Okay? For the course, there are three things that are required. Two textbooks. First one, the Holy Bible, um, the New American Bible Revised Edition, which is a, a Catholic translation of the Bible. Yes, you need a Catholic translation of the Bible because there are extra books in a Catholic Bible that Protestant Bibles do not have. They do not recognize certain books in the Old Testament as being inspired by the Holy Spirit. So you need a Catholic Bible, and that should be a, both. Both of these books I'm going to talk about should be available at the bookstore. Um, Except for the next one, I just spoke too soon. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, second edition, with the revision of paragraph 2267 by Pope Francis. I don't know why they had to put out a whole new edition just because one paragraph was revised, but nevertheless, there you go. Um, that apparently on the bookstore, on the bookstore's website, that book is apparently sold out. At least it's not available. So I sent out a link to the class for Christian faith with a, excuse me, I sent out an email to the class for Christian faith with a link to Amazon with copies that you can find, or a cop, copies that you can find and purchase for yourself if you were not able to get one. And the third thing is any and all material that might be assigned by the instructor, which I don't know, could be handouts or readings or things. I don't, I don't know. May, maybe not, but possibly. Okay, now we diverge. Now I'm going to talk about the world religions class. Um, and if you are not in the world religions class, then you can just take a moment to uh, think about what I've said or just do something else for, you know, maybe five minutes. Um, maybe it won't take that long, but nevertheless. Or you can listen in. For those who are in world religions, uh, same days, Tuesdays and Thursdays, but the time is, the meeting time is at 12.30 p.m. Same room number and everything I've said about uh, meeting with me and uh, contacting me remains the same. The course description obviously is different. The six major religions of the world, Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and most probably not, wah, wah, the Chinese religions are examined in a comparative manner. The course focuses on the historical developments of each religion and their, which should really be its, respective treatments of common themes such as sacred literature, moral behavior, salvation motifs, although some religions don't talk about salvation like Buddhism, really. Um, but anyway, salvation motifs and the role of prophetic figures, and not all religions have prophets, but again, there you go. Um, so yeah, we will hit Hinduism. Judaism, Christianity, Islam, hopefully Buddhism, if there's enough time. I, I, I will, yeah, I'm almost certain we'll do Buddhism. I'm not sure if we'll get to the Chinese religions, which I'm assuming they mean Taoism, Taoism. They could mean Confucianism and, and uh, whatever. Um, I don't know if we'll get to that, but I, I'm hedging my bets by saying most probably not, but try, you know. Um, uh, the required textbooks, there's only one required textbook for the course, that's uh, the book by Robinson and Rodriguez, World Religions, A Guide to the Essentials, 3rd Edition, that is available uh, on the bookstore's website, so please get it as soon as possible if you have not gotten it already. Um, and again, any and all materials as might be assigned by the instructor. Now, World Religions is different. There will be a number of materials i.e. readings, PDF files, and whatnot that you will have to do and will be supplied by me and are already present on the Canvas website. Um, although they're not in alphabetical order yet, I'll take care of that eventually. But the, the readings are all there and, and links to the reading, to readings are all there on Canvas already. Um, 
for those, I will also put and send out in an email a copy of chapter one of the book World Religions because I'm not sure if everyone may have been able to get it yet. Um, there was a there was a, an issue with the ISBN. I I didn't realize they put out a third edition. I was going to have the second edition, and unfortunately, Baker Academic was no longer publishing that, which is fine. Good to know. Um, but uh, you might not have been. Some of you might not have been able to get the book in time, or might be waiting for it to come. Okay, so that's that's the the uh, long and the short of world religions. Now I'll stay with world religions again because I said the syllabus is like ninety percent the same for either course, so there's no reason for me to switch back and forth. So you people in Christian faith, start listening again, please, because this is important. What are the course requirements? Here I give you a a uh, a what you call it a. Uh, a list of what are the grading elements for the course um, and what you'll be graded on and the weighted values for these for these things there will be there are tests there are assignments and there is class participation under tests there is one final exam which will be given at the end of the course there are five quizzes which will be given under assignments there are two papers that will be written uh, there is a three discussion board uh, threads and posts and finally, there's class participation, and you can see here how these things are weighted. Um, the final exam is almost half the grade of the course, so that's important, obviously, because it's it will be cumulative, um, since it's the only exam of the course. The quizzes amount to 20%, the papers are 15%, etc., and so forth, and then all ends up to, to 10%. Please note that I, I, I'm not saying you would do this. I'm not saying my students would do this, but it, it has happened, you know, I think, at least I've heard of it happening where people try to play a sort of calculus, a grade calculus, where they try to figure out, well, how much can I do to still get a passing grade? What's the least I can do? So can I not do any of the quizzes and just really ace the final exam? Maybe do none of the papers, but still do the quizzes and the discussion board, blah, 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 blah. Uh, really, I don't understand why people want to waste their time on this. It's a lot of mental energy wasted, in my opinion, but some people do this. Please note that if you do not accomplish one of the grading elements, you will automatically receive a grade of F for the course. Okay, what does that mean? Someone decides, I'm not going to do any of the papers. I'll do everything else, but I just don't want to do the papers. So the two papers are not done. Well, that's a grading element. You didn't do it, so you didn't complete an essential element for grading. You will get an F. Okay, is that clear enough? Perhaps. So, so please don't do that cal grade calculus. Just, just do the work. Okay. Um, class participation is treated differently and will be dealt with um, below. Okay. Uh, here is the grade scale, uh, which I think is pretty standard. I got this from a syllabus of another professor who teaches at Gwynedd Mercy, so I'm just following what I was given, so I'm assuming that this is correct. So uh, you should be familiar with the grade scale. Um, your grade, you can find your grades on Gradebook and Canvas if you don't already know. Uh, and when I put them on, on the Gradebook, they will be in the percentage format. So let's say one of the quizzes has 50 questions, okay, and every question is one point. You get 40 questions out of 50, Canvas will convert that into a percentage so you'll know what you got. Um, Okay, uh, there's other information. I don't have to go over each and every piece of information here. You should, and let me say, say this and stress this, you should read the syllabus for yourself because I am not going to go over each and every tidbit of information. Okay, you should re go over the syllabus and read it for yourself. If for nothing else, then to highlight all those things that you have to do so you know what you have to do for the course. There is no grade curve for the course. First of all, I do not have a head for mathematics. So a simple grade curve, a complicated grade curve, I, you don't want me doing that because I'll screw it up. <laughs> and I don't do it. I don't believe in grade curves because I believe that you should get the grade that you earned. I think that's fair to the people who apply themselves and deserve their grade and is, is not fair, not just for the people who don't really apply themselves, but they get a higher grade. They get bumped up because I give a curve. There will be no curve. Nor should you expect any kind of extra credit or assignment. I'm already teaching the course. This is the course. These are the assignments you're expected to do. When you ask me to do an extra credit, because your grade is low, 
that means you either haven't done assignments and you've gotten like a zero on them, or you've done poorly on assignments or tests, which is not my fault. I mean, you should be prepared to do these things and you should make sure that you do them well. Um, so I hesitate at giving, really hesitate at giving extra credits because frankly, it makes more work for me and I've already got enough work with the course. So you should not expect any extra credit in, uh, to be given and you should be aware of this, especially if you have um, like a scholarship or something that's tied to your GPA. Um, and then sometimes people will say, well, at the end of the course, we'll say, I need an extra credit. You know, my GPA is low. I'll lose my scholarship. Well, you know, that I, uh, if your GPA is yet low, it means you've been doing poorly in your other classes as well. So it's not just me. Okay, so, you know, people try to make that argument with me and um, try to force me to give an extra credit. No, I, you should not expect extra credit. If your GPA is already low that you're going to lose a scholarship, that means that you haven't been doing the work in, uh, in, in other classes, including mine. So just not, this does not apply to all of you, but there might be one or two people out there that need this little kick in the pants to, so that they know, okay, he's not going to give me an extra credit, so I got to be serious. In regards to uh, information, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act of 1974 prohibits me from discussing your academic information with anybody except you, the student, unless you get specifically give me permission, permission to discuss it with somebody else. But out of an abundance of caution, I probably will not discuss your, your, your progress except with you. All the tests and assignments are administered through Canvas. That's where you should look for them, look for the quizzes, and look for the assignments. Okay, I give a little description here of what the tests and assignments are used for, what's their purpose. Um, basically, to break it down, tests are, are being used by me to gauge your knowledge of the material, of the, the data and the facts that we've gone over, um, or I should say data because we're dealing with religion, we know we're not dealing with facts. <laughs> um, but anyways, and assignments are used to evaluate your mastery of the material, how you under are able to understand it, okay? Tests, uh, obviously, are going to be based on the lectures, the readings, and any educational aids. Mostly, the educational aids will be PowerPoint slides, which are based on the lectures anyway, so they're kind of one and the same. Um, I, will make an, I will make an effort to put the PowerPoints on Canvas. Um, there are, I don't think there are any PowerPoints on there yet, and that's uh, just because I've been you know, it's, I haven't had time to work on them and I've wanted to make revisions to some of them and it's just, it just takes time. So I will get them on there as soon as possible. If you're curious about what kind of questions will be on a, on a test or exam, I tell you multiple choice, true, false, um, any and all of these could be on, on any and all tests. And what kind of, and what number of questions because people want to know, um, for um, quizzes, you should expect between 40 to 50 questions. On the final exam, there will be 100 to 120 questions uh, because it's basically a two-hour exam. Um, the test will be administered on Canvas. There will be a time limit, so once you start it, you can't stop it. You have, uh, I believe, two hours to take um, the test. Well, actually, let me see. We'll, we'll find out. Um, but there is a time limit, so you need to be aware of that. And after finishing the test, you will be able to see your score on the test, but it will not be available until um, later in the next week. Uh, this is to protect the integrity of the test so that people aren't seeing the correct answers before uh, other people, so they cannot be shared, and also to address any unusual circumstances like people, you know, their computer crashed in the middle of the test and they need extra time. Okay, so uh, you will be able to complete the test. You might, I'm not clear about what Canvas does because I can't see what you see. I can only see what I can see as the instructor. And what you see as the student is sometimes different from what I see on Canvas, um, which I hate, by the way. I, I detest Canvas, but, you know, we're stuck with it. Um, I'm stuck with it, I should say. 
And uh, although it does allow the option to not see the correct answers, you might be able to see the answers or at least where you got answers wrong, I think, after the test is done. I think. I don't, I don't, again, I don't know. But uh, you shouldn't be able to see the test answers after the test until the following, either, either the following Wednesday for quizzes or in the case of exam week, the first day following finals week. In case of a yeah, final exam week, the first day following finals week, you'll be able to see your answers on the final exam. Yes, you can use your class notes for taking a test, even for the final exam, uh, because I think your class notes should be helpful to you. I would still recommend that you study them, that you still read them over, read them through before you take any quiz or test, uh, just so your mind is fresh. But you can use them. I think they should benefit you. Um, but you should not share them with somebody else, uh, unless, of course, the person wasn't in class, then you could give them a copy of your notes, but you shouldn't be sharing notes to take the quiz. Make sure that you're taking the, uh, any test um, on a, uh, an appropriate device. Don't try and do it on your cell phone. I don't recommend that because all sorts of things can happen because the browsers are different on cell phones. If you have a Samsung, Samsung has its own browser on its cell phone and it might not work well with Canvas. Um, you might lose uh, your signal or your connection. And, uh, you know, if you're in the middle of taking a, a quiz or something, then it might, you know, end the quiz and submit it for you. So just, just be aware of these issues uh, and try to be proactive before trying to take a test, or especially in, in taking tests. Um, there should be no problems. I mean, in this day and age, there, there, should be, there shouldn't be a problem with you um, starting and completing a test. Okay, I shouldn't have to restart it for you or extend time. Um, but it might happen, and it might happen due to you not using the proper devices, okay? But as I say, you should know to bene. You should not expect that I will allow you extra time to retake a test. I might just say, you tried to take it on your cell phone, and the test, you know, you lost your signal and the test submitted. Yeah, lesson learned. Don't do that again. The final exam. Talk about that first. There'll be one final exam during finals week. You will have the whole length of finals week to do the final exam. Hopefully you'll get it done early. I would recommend you just get it done. But you will have all of finals week to get the final exam done on Canvas. So don't come to class for finals week. I won't be there. I give you the date for finals week, so when the final exam will be made available and when it should be should be turned in. The final exam will have a time limit of two hours and thirty minutes. Okay, it will be cumulative. The quizzes will be given on certain dates on Canvas. I give you a list here of all the dates they'll be available on. Maybe you'll see a pattern available by six p.m. on Friday on the certain Fridays and then do a week later at the end of the day. Again, don't push this. I notice a lot of, I mean, I'm, I'm maybe blowing in the wind here, but, or whistling in the wind, but because uh, I notice that a lot of, even no matter how much I say it, people still do it. They wait until the end of the week to the bitter end to get the quiz done. Um, when well, you're playing with fire, you know, because something could happen, but I would suggest trying to get the quiz done as soon as possible, but you do have a whole week. And you will have one hour to take the quiz. Okay? Um, the material covered on the quizzes is not cumulative. So what was covered from class to class will be on the quiz. Okay? So I'm not going to go, uh, you know, so uh, from each class to class. So it's not cumulative. So it's not like quiz three, which is given in March, will can include, possibly include all the information covered from from the beginning of the course until March 15th. No, no, it'll be what was what was covered in the course from quiz number two on to quiz number three. Okay, the assignments are comprehensional. They want, I want to see that you understand what's being talked about. You can think about it. The questions will be made available on Canvas for you to do, and I will also um, make available the rubric for grading the assignments, um, the papers, Start first with the papers. The papers, there are two papers, and here are the dates on when they are due on these two Mondays. 
You upload them to Canvas. You will upload them in a Word file format. In fact, that's the only file format that I will accept, that Canvas will accept. So make sure that you uh, save it in a, a file, a Word file format. If you don't, then it won't upload, and you just have to go back and convert it. This, this is especially good to know if you're using uh, Google. Um, what's it McCall? What's it McCall? It. Um, uh, it's word processing thing. I can't. It's not coming to me right now. But if you're using Google Docs, and uh, Google Docs will sometimes um, default to its own format, an open file format, which is not which is not a word file format. So you need to be aware of that, and you might have to change it. When you write something for me, okay, there will be um, there will be a word count. I think that's the easiest way to to judge the assignment rather than giving pages and how many pages and whatnot. No, there'll be a word count for each assignment, and the uh, the word count applies to the body of the text. It does not apply to any identifying information or if you give me a cover page or anything like that. Um, footnotes, endnotes, anything. Uh, the word counts will be rigorously enforced. If you don't meet the minimum word count even by one word, you'll receive a deduction in points. I will, ha however, give you added points if you go over the word count. And that should be uh, defined uh, or outlined in the rubric. The minimum word count, the minimum I expect you to write for each paper is 800 words. That amounts to about two pages. So it's not very long, okay? Um, so it's 800 words. What else more can I, you know, what more do I say? It's not a writing intensive course. However, it is a university level course. So I expect that when you write something for me, you are going to write it in a fashion that is appropriate to a university student. Um, your, your paper should um, be formatted uh, appropriately and consistently. I'm not because it's not an, a writing intensive course, I'm not going to tell you what font you have to use, the size of the font, blah, 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 blah. I'm not going to do all of that. Consistency is the thing, okay? If you give me a, a paper that's in Times New Roman font, and halfway through the paper, all of a sudden it's Courier New, I'm going to be like, what's what's going on here? Okay, that shows sloppiness on your part. That shows that you didn't go, you didn't properly um, proofread your paper and make um, correction and, and notice things. So, so you want to be consistent. If you're going to use one inch margins, use one inch margins. Don't use one inch margins on one page and then half an inch margin on another. Okay. Don't give me double space um, through most of it and then single space through part of it. You know, be consistent. Okay, your formatting should be consistent. Um, if you're inconsistent or sloppy or you're, it's confusing, then you might get a deduction in your grade. The one thing I do require you to give me is identifying information. And this is what I want. I give, give you an example. And again, this is like whistling in the wind. Even though I give a flat out example of what I want to see, people still will not do this. And I don't know why. And you'll lose points for it. I take off points if you can't do Simply follow this instruction. It's very simple. Give me your name. Give me the title of the course and give me the paper number. That's it. You know, so Jane Doe, here it's John Smith. It could be Jane Doe, RS 147DG, Christian Faith, or it could be uh, RS 115, World Religions, paper number one, paper number two. That's it. Just so I know who it is, what course it's fr from or for, and which assignment it is. That's what I need to know. That's the most I need to know. That's what you should give me. Nothing more, nothing less. The discussion board. There are three discussion board assignments, and uh, obviously on Canvas. What this means for you is that you will have to open one unique thread on a question that I will pose, and then you will have to um, comment on two other threads by two other students, so two separate students. So you're going to, as I say, as I say, outline right here. It's specify here. At the end of at the end of the discussion board, you should have one thread of your own plus one unique comment on two different threads by two different other students. And I tell you here when these things are due. The main focus of the discussion board assignment will be on the required readings for the course. So I'll take something from one of the readings and ask you to discuss it. 
is to kind of make sure you're doing the readings, or at least the readings I, reading I want you to discuss. <laughs> um, there's really no word count for the discussion board thread or for your comments. You can write as much or as little as you want, but I want to see that you've shown that you've done the required reading, understood it, and you've been able to apply it to something. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's going to be up to you. And that's going to be up to, and I'll say it right now, it's not in, in the syllabus. And I, well, I give you the rule of thumb. The student should write enough to demonstrate that he or she has done the reading and understood it. Okay. But again, it's going to be up to my judgment how well you've done that. I mean, if you just write a really short thread, even though, okay, I can tell you've done the reading, but you're probably not going to get full credit for it if, if it's very short, because it shows we didn't really put a lot of effort into it. Um, on the other hand, someone could write something very long, and it could just be, you know, uh, obvious the person didn't know the re didn't do the reading or didn't understand it and again you won't get full credit for it so just you know i'm not applying a hard and fast word count for the discussion board either for the, the discussion board thread or for the comments um i'll let you be the judge of that but um you you know you should remember that i'm going to be the ultimate judge of whether you fulfilled the requirement Class participation and attendance, okay, these are two things that can affect your grade. You will be graded according to class participation. This means that you come to class prepared and ready to participate. Um, in other words, that means you bring the textbooks and the readings to class that we might talk about. You, you can uh, volunteer to do a reading. You can ask or answer a question from me, uh, of me and from me and paying attention okay um participation also includes not being late for class because that obviously if you're late you weren't there to participate and it's based on my subjective impression of the quality and quantity of your participation so i give you just an example of what that means to me Basically, an A range is, you know, you had the best, you know, you came prepared with the textbook and the readings, you frequently asked or answered questions, you volunteered to read, and uh, the quality of that will be judged by this scale here, that a person who consistently did this and was excellent about it will probably get 100 in the A range. You know, someone who was pretty good, pretty good, well, I shouldn't say pretty good, but really good. And, uh, but maybe, you know, wasn't as participatory as they could be all the time, you know, might get a 95 or something like that. Um, I mean, no one's perfect. So uh, I doubt, you know, anyone would get really get in the 100 range, but I will try to be, I will try to be generous in giving class participation. Okay. I, I don't want to you know, drive myself crazy trying to figure out, okay, the, the person did this and that, and that, and the other thing, and that, you know, you go nuts, you know, like obsessive compulsive. But um, I will try to be generous in how I define a person participates. If a person does a reading in the class, they participated. Okay, that's good. They do, you know, it's not like you always have to do this, each of these things in every class to get a good grade. Like I always, hey, hey, Dr. Dunn, look, I have my textbook. I have, you know, I'm prepared, you know, and okay, now I have to answer and ask a question. So he sees me, oh, I'm going to do volunteer one reading. So I do all three in the class. So, you know, now I get class participation. No, you know, maybe if you volunteer to read, I'll take that generously as class participation and give you a check mark, even though, um, Maybe you didn't uh, ask a question otherwise, but you did volunteer to read. So I'll, that's what I mean by being generous about it. Uh, and I will weight more heavily the fact that you are actively participating in the course by doing readings and asking questions than whether you were late to class or maybe you forgot one of your textbooks or something like that. Being absent from class or late to class will negatively impact your class participation grade. Because there are two things going on here. With, with absence, and, and absence is serious, because not only are you not at the class meeting, which you should be at, but because you're not at the class meeting, you can't possibly participate. So there are two things going on here, two things being affected by an absence, okay? Whereas with a late, Really, only one thing is being negatively affected, and that's your participation. 
okay? Because uh, you still show up to class, so you're not absent, but you are late, and so you can't participate. So the, you know, I, I look at them differently. The impact to your class participation is this. If you are absent for more than three class meetings for any reason, then I will start deducting your class participation grade to the next lowest grade for each and every absence beyond those three. Okay, so every time after that, you start fall going down that you're absent. So let's say for so what this means is if we go back up to my my range, let's say someone had an 89 and it was in the B range an 89 in class participation. You know they mostly you know they mostly participated. You know mostly did things. Okay, um, and they so I'm going to give them was going to give them an 89, but they were absent for four times. Well, that's three absences plus one, so they would drop to an 85. The same principle applies to lateness, but at a different degree. Any student who is late to class more than five times will have the class participation grade reduced beyond those five, for every absence beyond those, or excuse me, for every lateness beyond those five. Any student who is caught by me actively ignoring me watching videos, surfing the internet, playing games, listening to music in their earbuds, then you will have your class participation graded harshly by me. I will make a note of it in my class, class participation um, list sheet, and I will, and I will remember you um, at the end of the course. You will be graded harshly for that. You know, I mean, if it happens once, as I say, we all make mistakes. If it's happened once, I probably will ignore it. But if I notice it happening again and again and again, then there will be consequences. Okay, the fo the fo the consequence will be that I will reduce um, your class participation grade by one letter grade for each occurrence. So if let's again let's talk about um, our our hypothetical person who has an eighty nine. Okay, and I catch the person you know like twice actively ignoring me watching cat videos while <laughs> i'm teaching class you know that will drop to a 79 it will drop to the next grade down which will be a 79 so the person will go from a b to a c and if it happens again uh, whoops um if it happens again it'll go from a 79 to a 69 so you see what i mean by harsh because it is it is truly well, I mean, not, I'm not judging anybody, but the action is truly a rude one and a disrespectful one to me. Um, when I'm doing, trying to do my job and I find people are actively ignoring me and making a decision not to, not to listen to me. Okay. Um, you, now you can sit there and I can't control what's going on in your mind. You could sit there and daydream and I don't know. I don't know that you're not listening to me, but when you're making a decision to watch videos on your computer or do work for another class or listen to music, um, that goes beyond just simply, oh, I'm not paying attention to him because I'm bored or whatever. It's also disrespectful to your other students because it, it distracts them and they can see what you're doing and it can just be distractive to them as well and that bothers me so that's why i grade it so harshly now i'm not a policeman okay i'm not going to police the course and i'm not going to police the class okay this is if i catch you and it doesn't matter if every and i'm going to be clear about this it does not matter if everyone else is doing it it matters that you were caught okay because I'm not policing everybody. I'm not going to go around and check everyone's computer, uh, you know, before class or during class. But if I'm walking around the class teaching and I see this person's not paying attention to me, I can see what they're doing, then you've been caught. And I'll make a note of it. It doesn't matter if three or four other people are doing it. I didn't see them. I saw you. And if I see them, then I will I'll make a note of it for them too. Just so you know. Class attendance, you're expected to attend each class meeting on time and for the full duration of the class meeting. This is effectively your job. Even if you are working another job, and, and you know this if you are working another job in addition to going to school, you have to be there on time. So you have to be there. You shouldn't arrive late, nor should you leave early. 
Okay. Again, I know I'm blowing, um, I'm whistling in the wind on this one because, you know, about five minutes, sometimes even 10 minutes before class, people will start packing up as if they've got someplace better to be. Um, which, again, I'm going to, I'm not judging anybody, but it's very rude. It's very disrespect. I feel disrespected by that. But people do it. Nevertheless, come to class. Um, if you're in class, then you are marked present. If you're not in class, you're marked it, you're marked absent. And if you come after class has begun, then you will be marked late. How do I how do I judge these things? The rule of thumb is if you arrive to class just as or after I have begun the class proper, you know, I've finished taking class attendance and I've started talking about things related to the course or answering a student's question about the course or start the le class lecture, then you will be marked late. Obviously, if you never show up, then you're going to be marked absent, okay? No absence or lateness is excused. You can always send me an email explaining why you weren't there or why you're going to be late. That's fine. I appreciate that. And, um, and honestly, I will take that into account when I compute your final grade and I'm looking at absences and lateness and whatnot. Um, but um, you should send me an email because if you try to speak to me personally about it, say, hey, Dr. Dunn, I'm not going to be here next week. I might not remember. So it's good to, to, confirm, to confirm it, to uh, back it up with an email to me. Um, but sending me an email is still, even if I respond to it, is not in and of itself an excuse to be absent or late, okay? They're, because they are not excused. However, I understand that stuff happens and you might not be able to come to class. Obviously, stuff happens, snow happens, you know? A people person gets into an accident on the way to class or, you know, you have a family emergency. I understand that. Okay, nevertheless, these are my policies, and this is why I have these policies, because I do understand that stuff happens. If you are absent from more than three class meetings, for any reason, you should expect to receive a deduction of five points from your final grade for each and every absence beyond those three. Okay? No absence is excused. I, ha I say that. However, this is the, that's the principle, but in the real world, it happens, okay? So I'm not going to penalize you for the first three class meetings that you might have to take an absence. Maybe you got sick, the car accident I mentioned, okay? I, I, I'm overlooking those absences, okay? That does not mean that you have three freebies. Nevertheless, for those three class meetings, I won't look at it. I won't look at them. However, after that, you should expect to get five points deducted from your, for any reason, from your grade. Because I'm giving, I'm already giving you three times, okay? So if you know you're going to need an absence, like you think you might get sick or you're worried you might get the flu during the semester, prepare for that. Guard your absences in a way, you know? So if you need, really need those three absences, then use them. Because after that, you're going to get points taken off. Any student who misses nine class meetings, which is about a third of the course, just will be failed outright. I'm not going to pass somebody, even if you do all of the grading elements, I'm not going to pass you for, for not coming to the course. And a third of the course is a, a large chunk of the course. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's like a month or more of the course. That's not going to happen. Um, you're not going to pass. Any student who is late to more than five class meetings for every any reason will receive a deduction of two points from the final grade, okay, for each and every act of lateness, okay? Um, again, be, this, this pertains to class participation. You're not there to participate, but also you're expected to be there in class on time, okay? Okay. Um, no, I, 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 deb I debate that one, but it's there in the syllabus, so I'll leave it. But uh, I just want to insist on even being late. You know, you, you should uh, you should be aware of that. Okay. Um, if you are late or absent, make sure to get the notes from somebody, someone who takes them well, who pays attention and takes them well. Uh, certainly, uh, you can listen to the lecture that I will post on YouTube, uh, so you can watch that on YouTube and uh, take notes from that yourself, which I would recommend if you are absent. 
or if you've been late from a class, uh, but that's your responsibility, not mine. Due dates and lateness, you should be aware of the due dates and the times for the tests and assignments. Um, you know, you have to be proactive as best you can in foreseeing and resolving any problems. Okay, so you don't, what I mean by that is you don't want to wait until the last minute to take a test or to try to upload a paper because you don't know what could happen. Something could happen. Um, now, this is not like the old days where I'm expecting you to print stuff out and hand it in in class. And so your printer, you know, you could run out of ink or your printer could break and stuff like that. No, this is not like that. But it could be that you, you go to upload your paper and, uh, you know, um, in a disastrous moment, you just you deleted your paper and have to write it over, um, and, and you waited until the last minute to do it anyways. Or you're taking a quiz, and uh, the as I've mentioned before, the signal goes out. But you you should be proactive, not me. That's not my job. Okay, you should try to get your work done as as soon as possible, so that can be so so it can be submitted. Okay. It is your it, your your responsibility to address any all any and all problems or issues that you might encounter. I'm I'm not there to solve them, especially the technology issues. I don't want to sound mean, but that's not my job. That's their job. You go to information technology if you have issues with Canvas, um, or or with um, if you have well, Canvas would be the main issue, uh, like uploading things or taking tests or getting on Canvas to begin with certainly inform me that you're having a problem. You, you should tell me, okay? I will be sympathetic and I will take that into account, but I will not solve it for you. Lateness. This is not lateness to the class, this is lateness of assignments. Any assignment or test that's not submitted on its due date will be considered late and will receive a 10% deduction from its grade for each day that it, is, that it is late. I have already set up Canvas to do this automatically, so I don't need to do it. So that's it. If Canvas Canvas knows when the due date is, okay? Already, it's already program will already be programmed in by me. So once that due date hits, if you're late, even by a few seconds or a minute, 10 point deduction or 10% deduction, excuse me. Okay, so just so you know. If you're having problems, then you should contact me immediately, if not sooner. And as the Bible says, mercy triumphs over judgment from the letter of James, chapter 2, verse 13. So if there is an issue beyond your control, I will try to be flexible. Okay? Um, however, the nature of the reason for its lateness, even if it's a serious one, like you've had a death in the family, and i got to be honest with you, Someone seems to die on me every semester. I, I don't want to be a big downer on this. <laughs> every semester, somebody's uncle or somebody's godparent-in-law or somebody keels over, you know, and dies. And so someone couldn't get an assignment in on top. Okay, all right, yeah. I understand. I will be flexible, try to be, because mercy triumphs over judgment. But that does not, in and of itself, get, should not give you an expectation that your late work will not be marked late. I'm ba that's basically me, me covering my butt, all right? If I have to, if I absolutely have to say to somebody, sorry, it's still going to be marked late. Academic honesty. I quote here from the uh, undergraduate catalog. Basically, don't plagiarize, don't cheat. Um, uh, plagiarism and cheating are basically stealing other people's ideas, other people's work. Actually, they define cheating, but they don't define plagiarism, do they? Um, ba -ba 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 -ba, so if I include the bit of cheating, quiz to falsifying, deception, plagiarism. Okay, they do mention plagiarism. Um, cheating, they define cheating. What is plagiarism? They don't define plagiarism. Plagiarism is really a form of cheating. It's, it's basically like in rap music and hip-hop, where people sample other people's work. They call it sampling. Which is fine, as long as they give them credit, and they might have to pay some royalties to the person who's, whose music they sampled. It's the same thing in academia. If I sample a person's ideas, you know, to bolster up my own claim, like if I'm making an argument, I'm writing 
writing a book or writing an article and I'm trying to make an argument, my own original argument, and I want to show, hey, other people kind of agree with parts of this argument or substantiate it, okay, and I quote them, that's not my work. Because I'm quoting them. I'm taking, whenever I go to a person's website, blog, book, article, and take their work, actively take their work, I have to give them credit. I have to cite the article where they, in the page number, in, or, or, or the chapter in the page, excuse me, the, the page number in the book, or the, the, uh, the hyperlink to the website or the blog where I got it from. And I have to say, I got this from, you know, um, Billy Bob Joe, <laughs> you know, on his website, this, he says this, but when Pete, when you just cut and paste a person's work and put it in there and give no attribution, um, it, it pr looks like it's your own work. It's your own idea. And that is serious. That's a form of cheating. It's a form of stealing, really. And it will be dealt with harshly. Okay. Any suspected act of plagiarism or cheating, will be referred to the student. I will talk to you all, bring it to your attention, and show you the examples or example or examples that I found and why I think it's cheating. And if I believe there is an act of plagiarism or cheating, then this is what will happen, okay? You will receive an F. At, at a minimum, you'll receive an F on the assignment or the test. If I think your plagiarism is, is especially egregious outside the box, severe, like you plagiarize most of the paper or something, then you'll get a zero. In addition, these this this action of cheating or plagiarism will be reported to the provost, to the office of the vice president of academic affairs, and I will also um, uh, make the, the matter um, known to the chair of my department. So don't do it. Okay, do your own work. If you know if it's not your own work, if you had to take it from somebody else, then you know you have to give them credit. You know, you have to, you know, you know this in, in life when you're telling someone a story, you're telling someone something, and you say, oh yeah, and Joe told me, blah, 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 blah. You're indicating to them that this information you're giving is not your own, okay? But might, maybe it supports what you're trying to say. It's the same thing in writing. We just call it plagiarism if you don't do it. If class is canceled, well, that's apropos. <laughs> if class is canceled, um, the university is closed, or I have to cancel the meeting. Let's say, God forbid, I got into an accident on my way down um, from North Jersey. Um, then this is what I'm. I'll, this is exactly what I'll do. I will make a video of the class lecture or the, the class meeting, and I will post it to YouTube, and then I will make it available to you. In all of my class lectures, I'm going to try to record, and I will make available on on YouTube, regardless of whether we're canceled or not. Um, I do not address virtual meetings, and that's a good question. I didn't think about uh, that honestly. Um, I do have Zoom on my personal computer, and I think it should work for a class meeting um and i guess i could try it if we have another issue like this and during the semester and see if it works okay and if it doesn't then i'll have to revert to just putting a, a video on youtube again which i will still have to do that for the, the class lecture on zoom um but i don't make any so virtue yeah there there is the possibility of having a virtual class meeting which i don't put into the syllabus did not put into the syllabus because honestly i didn't think of it but it is a possibility. Okay, yes, you can bring your computers to class and use them during the class meeting because how else are some people going to take notes? Um, but it's my expectation that you will only be using your computers for class-related activities, meaning my class, not for someone else's class, okay? Um, okay, you should email me through the Gwynedd Mercy email system and uh, you should check your emails uh, I'm assuming that you understand, you have an understanding of how to use the uh, G Mercy U portal, Canvas, email, the internet. This is 2024, people. I mean, I was born in 1972, and I remember in fifth grade, I think that was my first encounter with a real computer, a person, a PC, which was an old Radio Shack, huge, one big piece of gray plastic with this little window, black window in it. It was the coolest thing. We got to play games on it, math games and stuff like that. That was in fifth grade. Um, 
so I've been I've been alive before computers when just nobody had them. I've been alive when we, people started getting them. So I know computers. I'm 51 years old. If I can deal with, if I can figure all of this stuff out with my monkey brain, you who have never known a world without these things should know how to use these things intuitively. So I'm assuming you do. It's not my job to explain how to use them. Okay. You, uh, okay. Um, yeah. What else? Contact and email policies. I think I already mentioned that about email. Contacting me through Grin and Mercy email. Um, if you do send me an email, I will respond within two business days. And a business day is Monday through Friday. It does not include weekends. So don't expect, if you email me on a Friday, do not expect me to email you back on Saturday. Certainly, I will not email you back on Sunday because that is the Lord's Day and it's a day of rest. So I will not do that. Um, but you know, that's, that's, that's my policy to give me two days to respond to you. And if I forget, then I sincerely apologize beforehand, but that should be enough time for me to respond. Okay. Some miscellaneous date, uh, miscellaneous information, some important deadlines and dates you should be aware of, like the ad drop, withdrawal, spring break, and Easter holiday. That's, that has to be included. Um, yeah, ad drop. I mean, you, you now have a sense of me, I think, and my personality. Um, hopefully you've been able to see the syllabus already and you've printed it out or you've gone over it. So you understand kind of like what the course is about and what kind of the requirements are. Um, so you might decide that this course is not for you. So you have the ad drop period. It, go with God, my friend. Vaya con Dios. If you decide not to stay with the course because, you know, you don't like my personality, you don't like the way I'm going to teach the course, you don't like, you know, I'm asking too much or, or too little maybe, but <laughs> um, whatever. That's fine. That's that. I did that when I was a student. Okay. You know, I just, sometimes I didn't gel with the whole mission of the, the professor. And I was like, okay, so find another course, the same course, but a different time or day with somebody else. I understand that. Go with God. That's God bless you. I perfectly understand that. Um, if you need to withdraw because you're getting a bad grade in the course, I hope not, but you know, there you go. You've got the date. Um, again, this is not a writing intensive course, but I do expect that you know how to write. Um, it is not, I once had a student, um, I was teaching a course, it was introduction to religious studies at another school. And I remember I had a student who, who got a, well, a lower grade than she expected on a paper she wrote. And, and one of the reasons was it was very poorly written. It, it was, you know, unintelligible in some parts. The grammar was terrible. The spelling was terrible. Um, and I found that I spent a lot of my time having to grade that just to get through the paper. And she objected to that. She said, this is not an English course. This is not a writing course. You shouldn't be grading, you know, you shouldn't be, you should just grade what's there. You shouldn't be grading our grammar and our spelling and a style. And I said to her, yes, Miss So-and-so, you're right. I shouldn't have to be grading those things. I shouldn't. I should be able to just sit down with your work and read it through and think through the ideas that you're presenting. I shouldn't have to stop every other sentence and say, okay, this is a run-on, or this is misspelled, or this verb is wrong in the wrong tense. You know, I sh no, you're right. I shouldn't have to do those things. So make sure when you're presenting your product, it's the final product. You've gone over it. You've you've done spell check on your computer. You've you've looked at the grammar. You've you've maybe given it to somebody else and said, does this sound right? You've thought through what you've written and say, does this fo sentence follow from that one? Logically. Please do that and you'll get a good grade. If not, if I have to spend much of my time or half of my time or whatever part of my time grading grammar and style and spelling, which I shouldn't have to at this level, you're going to get a lower grade. Accessibility and support. Okay, those uh, there are some people who need 
reasonable accommodations or modifications for taking the course because they have a disability. That is perfectly fine. I will help you out as best I can. However, you need to contact the office, um, the accessibility support services. So I give you their email and I give you their web page. Okay, so you need to do that yourself. I cannot do it for you. The, the university cannot do it for you. You need to self-identify just so you know. Okay, and I give you even more information about that. Um, which was basically, this was given to me by the university, and I just pasted it into my uh, my syllabus here. Uh, same thing with the Title IX statement. If you feel that um, you have been sexually harassed, um, or you have been um, assaulted in some sexual way, or something like that, um, then you need to report that. That's what Title IX is all about. You need to report it to the university. And I give you um, what what they're talking about with uh, these things. For example, I must report an experience of sexual misconduct or sexual violence. So if someone tells me, you know, uh, they're crying in class and after class tells me, you know, my boyfriend raped me, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, thank you. I, but I have to report that under Title IX. I can't let that go. Or any other abuse. Um Okay, so, you know, these things, I need to report those things. You certainly should report those types of things. And, and what do you do to file the Title IX, um, uh, uh, a Title IX uh, uh, claim? This is what you do. These are the people you want to talk to. I give you their names, their emails, their phone numbers. Um, and then there's a thing about pregnant students who are entitled to accommodations also under Title IX. Um, obviously pregnancy doesn't, <laughs> doesn't have to do with sexual assault, but sometimes for some reason it's under title nine, I guess, you know, whatever. Um, and again, uh, you know, if you're pregnant and you need accommodations, then these are the people, this is the email you need to con to, to contact and the people you, person you need to contact. What is the objective of the course? The objective of the course is to, is to aid God and each other in the salvation of our souls. That's the purpose of life to be with God in heaven. Heaven is simply a fancy theological word. Um, actually, it's a pagan word, probably just means the sky. But it's a word, it's a metaphor for being in the presence of God forever. And that's, that's what life is about, and that's what this course is about. It's also about becoming better, more well-rounded members of the Gwynn and Mercy University community of the world. More loving, more merciful, more patient, more accepting, um, yeah, those ways. Upon the completion of the course, you should be able to do all these sorts of things. I'm not going to go through them. This is actually for world religions. I have a different list, obviously, for Christian faith. Let's go down to that. Yeah, Christian faith, okay. All right, that's Christian faith. This is world religions. And uh, you can look at those yourself. Yes, the government, and you know, I think it's the government, wants, uh, you know, agent, accrediting agencies want to see these in syllabi. You know, you should be, you know, able to show what you can do with the course. And then you should know these things and have learned these things. So there you go. The schedule of class meetings. The schedule is tentative and subject to change. So it is in, it's set in stone in a way, but it's also kind of fluid, um, depending on whether I talk more about something or talk less about something. But nevertheless, you should always be doing the reading. Just follow the schedule of readings as they are. Now, for uh, since I'm on the world religion syllabus, I'll talk about the world religion schedule first. Um, and then I'll move on to the Christian faith one, which is here. Just some things I want to point out. Um, today is the 16th, and we had the introduction to the course, and I talked, I'm talked. i talking about the syllabus. On Thursday, we'll open the course with a definition of religion, and by, you should have by then read Chapter 1 of World Religions, if you have the textbook. Again, I'm going to put a copy of Chapter 1 on Canvas, and I'll, I guess I'll also send it out in an email so people have it, because I'm not sure if everyone has the textbook, because we haven't met yet, so I can't ask anybody. Um, but you should read Chapter 1 at some point in the next few days, okay? Then we'll have a very brief introduction to religious studies. We'll talk about the Catholic Church and other religions, because it is a Catholic school, and I think we should. that's important to know. So there are readings from the Bible there. Um, 
and uh, all of these things like uh, just um, all of these readings that I have, the Bible, uh, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the Second Vatican Council, other things. Um, the textbook is the textbook. You should have that in hand. But all these other readings are available on Canvas. For example, the Bible, I have a link to the Bible on Canvas under, uh, uh, I think it's under Modules. And uh, you follow the link to the website, and then you can just read the Bible online. You don't have to have you don't have to have a Bible to do it. Um, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the same thing. There's a link to a page with uh, with uh, the Catechism, the Second Vatican Council. I give you the documents as PDF files on uh, Canvas, and the same thing with all these other documents: the Rig Veda, Bhagavad Gita, um, an article from the Newark Star Ledger, blah 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 blah. The Tanakh, which is the Jewish Bible, um, I believe I give you a uh, a link to the Tanakh on Canvas. I also, for the Quran, or the Quran, the readings from the Quran down here. Also, there's a link to an online website, so you don't have to, uh, to buy your own Quran. Okay, I don't think there's anything more I really need to say about that. Um, with regards to the Bible... Just very quickly, and this applies to those in Christian faith as well, so you might want to listen to this. With regards to the Bible, if, if you're not used to the Bible, it's really a very simple book. Um, every Bible will should most almost assuredly have a table of contents as at the front of the book, as with any book. Even though that's not what the Bible is, it's a collection of books. Nevertheless, they should have a table of contents. You go to the table of contents and find the name of the book here, like Second Book of Kings... So there are two books of Kings. This is the second book of Kings. Every book of the Bible, for the most part, there are exceptions that prove the rule, but almost every book of the Bible is going to be divided into chapters and verses, which are sequential. So you go, you find the second book of Kings and the table of contents. You turn to it in the Bible. You look for chapter 5. And then in chapter 5, you're going to see little numbers um, at the beginning of each sentence or every other sentence or whatever, and you follow those little numbers, so you only read numbers 1 to 19. Okay, easy? Simple? Okay. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, which again, this applies to people in the Christian faith course, is equally even easier than the Bible. It's just paragraph numbers. Okay, every, uh, where's my, um, hold on a second, let me get my copy. Ah, here we go. This is my copy, which is different than the one you'll have, because I bought this years ago. Um, uh, and if you open it up and you look, you know, you can't see this. Well, maybe you can see this as I put it up close. But you'll notice that there are these numbers. There's these numbers here, okay, at the beginning of each paragraph of information. All right? There are these numbers. 889, 890, 891. Those are the paragraph numbers, and that's what you follow. So when I say I want you to read paragraphs 836 to 848, that's it. That's not page numbers, my friend. Okay, don't get confused and think that's pa those are page numbers, because I don't want you to read that much. <laughs> I wouldn't want to read that much, you know? No, you're only reading numbers paragraph numbers 836 to 848 you're only reading paragraph numbers 2104 to 2109 okay so be aware of that okay don't make that mistake paragraph numbers in the catechism of the catholic church each paragraph is numbered very helpfully so it's very easy to get through um do i want to say anything else about any other thing that's here i, I think it's all should be self-explanatory um I think the one thing I do want to mention is the uh, is the Quran. The Quran is is like the Bible divided up into chapters and verses. But here, when we do the Quran or the Quran, um, I have you read the chapters. So this is chapter one, chapter five, chapter nineteen, chapter thirty six, chapter ninety six, and chapter one twelve. Okay, so that's all I want to say about that. Now, for Christian faith. Again, um, Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph numbers, not page numbers. I just told you how to find books in the Bible, so you find the book of Nehemiah and the table of contents, and you read chapter number 8. Okay, um, Basically, your readings are going to be taken from the Catechism and from the Bible. There aren't going to be a lot of outside readings here. 
In fact, in fact, I don't think I give you any outside readings. I might still, but I'm uh, probably won't because there's more than enough to be read from the Catechism and and the Bible. Um, maybe in some future class I'll change that. But anyways, so there's really nothing more I need to say about this. It might, for either course, for either the religion course or for the Christian faith course, when you're looking at the readings, I'm not going to lie to you. Um, some of the readings are longish, but very few of them. Most of the readings are quite short. So even when you see multiple readings, like you see uh, something that looks really long, okay, um, well, I shouldn't say that because that is kind of long. <laughs> Those readings are kind of good. Well, anyways, um, but like here, the Apostles and the Holy Church, Matthew chapter 10, verses 1 to 15. That's not a very long reading. Or you're only reading verses 13 to 19 in Mark chapter 3. It's really short. One verse in Acts of the Apostles. Short. Okay? Um, I will admit here that the Catechism reading, though, is kind of longish. You know, so 748 to 810. So you're going to have to read... Uh, you know, like your 60 or 70 paragraphs, and then 871 to 945, you're going to have to read uh, 30, maybe 70 paragraphs. So that, that is a little longish, okay? I'm not going to lie to you on that one. But, um, you know, I just don't want you to be, uh, I don't want you to be scared, okay? And in point of fact, I'm looking down here, I have you read 871 to 945 again. You could probably, you know, not read it and then read it down here. Maybe that's a little mistake in the syllabus. Oh, well. Um... But, you know, I just don't want you... And the same thing applies to the world religions. You know, you see some of these things like, okay, oh, Christianity, I've got to read these three things here. Yeah, but they're news articles. When, you know, they're New York Times, you know, um, National Catholic Reporter. They're not long. You know, they're like one page in a lot of cases. So they're not long. Other things like maybe the Augsburg, the Augsburg Confession are longish. Same thing with St. Paul's letter. Okay, Um yeah, I'm going to admit those are some those are longer readings that you'll just have to do and maybe you might want to spend spring break doing them instead of doing them for that course but for that class meeting but you know just don't be taken aback when you see you know like lists of readings like this cuz there's sometimes they're not really that long the readings that I'm asking you to do. And I'm giving you a lot of excerpts here, a lot of little tidbits, little bits and pieces from readings. I'm not giving you the whole reading, okay? Anywho, okay, so that's, I guess, what I wanted to say on that, on the uh, schedule. Oh, the question marks, this is for world religions. I guess I could have done this for Christianity or Christian faith as well. But, uh, you know, the question marks, I'm just allowing myself two classes in case I talk more about certain religions or find that I need to talk more. And I have to take another class, so I've got, you know, this class you know, open. Uh, on the other hand, if I stay on task and everything works out perfectly, then I have two classes where I can maybe do Chinese religions. I do want to talk about Jainism and Sikhism, which are two uh, Indian religions. So I might not get to Chinese religions at all, or I might might get to them at the very end. Or I might decide that I don't want to do Jainism. I would do want to do Chinese religions. I don't know. We'll see. Final announcements. By choosing to remain registered for this course, you are indicating your willingness to abide by and observe the policies, procedures, regulations, etc. outlined in the syllabus. Okay? If you don't want to abide by the policies of the syllabus, then drop the course. Make it easy on you. Make it easy on me. Um, if you refuse to abide by the standards, then, you know, I'll be I have to discuss things with you. And I guess those are standards that are understood for conducting the course, like not disrupting the course and stuff like that. Maybe I should have put that in the syllabus, but I didn't. Um, maybe I'll add that later on and put it out in an announcement. I don't know. But uh, basically, if you're going to stick with the course, then you're expected to um, abide by the standards of the course. I reserve my right to change or modify the syllabus at any time, and when I not not capriciously, um, not without reason. But if there is a reason that I need to, there's a, like there's a mistake in the syllabus, which I don't think there is any, are any. But you know, I might make a little correction. Well, actually, I did notice a little mistake then I, with the readings. Um, but you know, if I do need to, you know, explain something like uh, maybe I do need to put a code of conduct for how people should act in class. Um, I might have to do that. Well, then I'll, I'll, that's a modification or a change, and I'll, I'll send that out through Canvas, 
and through the email system so that you know that I'm making that change if, if I need to feel like I need to make that change. Okay. Okay. Um, I think that's it. That's that covers both syllabi for both courses, Christian faith and world religions. And I ask that God will bless you all and that we will all come together safely on Thursday where we can meet and, and get to know each other, know who we are, see each other and uh, begin the course. And uh, that's it. Now let me find my thing so I can end the court and <laughs> the video.